It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 249 at block height 662,248 on Sunday, December 20th. What is up, Janine? Wow, we're going to get the magic 250 in at the end of the year. Woohoo! Maybe we can make a tweet about it and sell it for Ethereum. Ew, why would we want that? Well, I hear that there are I don't very, do drugs, Shinobi. I, I hear they're very clueless people that will buy Ethereum for Bitcoin. Huh. But, uh, yeah. I think first up today, uh, we have some clarity on the rumors that have been swirling around for weeks regarding Mnuchin and the Treasury. Yes, we do. Uh, last month in November, and specifically Block Digest episode 245, we talked about Bitonic, a Bitcoin exchange based in the Netherlands, which was cooperating, although unhappily, with new screening requirements imposed by the Dutch Central Bank, DNB, under their Sanctions Act, which... Uh, requires customers to provide additional identifying information regarding addresses that they are withdrawing to, especially if it's a non-custodial wallet. Um, and this uh, practice is known as KYCC, know your customer's customer, because the address they could be withdrawing to may be theirs, it may be someone else's, either way, apparently the authorities want to know. And on November 25th, Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong tweeted that he had heard rumors the U.S. Treasury and Secretary Mnuchin were planning to rush out some new regulation regarding self-hosted crypto wallets before the end of his term. And I should note that uh, in this topic, this language that's used, uh, unhosted, self-hosted, are used interchangeably. I really hate these words. I'm going to read them anyway because they're in the things I'm quoting from. But I think that they're highly inaccurate because, I mean, you, what is it, unhosted wallet? Uh, you, what does it mean to host? Like, usually hosted means, you know, it sounds like a hot wallet to me, like to use the word hosted. So saying a self-hosted wallet, that sounds like you're, I don't know, you're running your own hot wallet infrastructure or something. So I hate these words and they don't make sense. Um, basically what they're talking about is non-custodial wallets. There's no need to reinvent words so you can stick your authoritarian stamp on the space or anything, people. Just use the words that, you know, actually make sense. But anyway, on uh, December 17th, the block reported that the U.S. Treasury uh, was on the cusp of putting forward a new transaction reporting rule for money services businesses, M MSBs, that interact with self-hosted crypto wallets. Uh, it could take the form of a notice of proposed rulemaking or interim final rule. Unlike a proposed rule, an interim final rule goes into effect immediately upon release. And thankfully, that was not what happened. At least that's not what's happened so far. Uh, FinCEN has since published an unlisted 
what appears to be an unlisted version of the proposed rulemaking on this issue. It In the document, it says it's scheduled to be published officially on the 23rd of December, but you can already access the current version on the Federal Register at the link in the... Well, actually, is it? I think I did put it in the show notes. Um, uh, if not, we'll add it. Yeah, so I'm going to read the summary. One second. So the summary in the proposal says FinCEN is issuing this notice of proposed rulemaking to seek public comments on a proposal to require banks and money services businesses to submit reports, keep records, and verify the identity of customers in relation to transactions involving convertible virtual currency or CVC, um, which is a bit confusing because isn't CVC the abbreviation for that, you know, little secret number on the back of your your debit card that you're these people are so dumb like what's seriously the, um what what does it mean in this context again though um convertible convertible for, virtual currency yeah yeah so i don't know they were very stupid choosing that acronym because that makes me think of the secret number on the back of your debit card that you're not supposed to share anyway people bad with words moving on um, or digital assets with legal tender status, uh, which they call legal tender, legal tender digital assets, or LTDA. Oh God, they're just making <laughs> they're just making up <laughs> terms and acronyms as they go along. Like, I'm sorry, but when <laughs> when I read legal tender digital assets, I thought of like <laughs> chicken tenders. <laughs> Give me my tendies. Someone's going to digitize uh, chicken tenders. Anyway, held in unhosted. Oh, here we go. Lots of uh, made up words. Held in unhosted wallets as defined below or held in wallets hosted in a jurisdiction identified by FinCEN. Okay, so wait. The whole hosted thing has to do with... Again, this makes no sense. The the ho- hosted versus unhosted. Like, if hosting has to do with where the private key, like who controls the private keys, then you how do you have an unhosted wallet? Like the wallet keys are somewhere. I don't understand. Anyway, um, hosted in jurisdiction identified by FinCEN. FinCEN is proposing to adopt these requirements pursuant to the Bank Secrecy Act (BSA), otherwise known as. Uh, well, the travel rule and everything is the Patriot Act of money, basically. To effectuate certain uh, wait, to effectuate certain of these proposed requirements, FinCEN proposes to prescribe by regulation that CVC and LTDA are monetary instruments for purposes of the BSA. However, FinCEN is not proposing to modify the regulatory definition of monetary instruments or otherwise alter existing BSA regulatory requirements applicable to monetary instruments in FinCEN's regulations, including the existing currency transaction reporting, CTR, requirement, and the existing transportation of currency or monetary instruments reporting requirement. That was quite long, but here is a more down-to-earth summary and analysis of the proposal from Coin Center, where they say, the proposal announced today is that transactions from regulated exchanges to individual wallets um, not subject to regulation as well as unregulated foreign exchanges should be subject to an existing automatic reporting requirement, currency transaction reports, CTR for cash transactions. Make no mistake, CTRs are a form of warrantless search and seizure of private finance records. Fifty years ago, the Supreme Court narrowly upheld the constitutionality of these reporting requirements, arguing that Americans lose their right to a warrant uh, with individual suspicion when they... um, and their private information over to third parties. We've written extensively why the continued constitutionality of these policies is in doubt. Um, Side note here, this is known as the third party doctrine, which is something that the EFF has also been fighting in relation to payment apps lately. Um, It basically says that you, it's like this, it's, it's not like an official standard, but it's just like part of statute that's built up that the assumption is that if you give information to the third party, including, you know, Google or Facebook or whatever, you are basically surrendering your expectation of privacy. You have no, you have very little or reduced 
uh, expectation of privacy when you give your information to third parties, which means that the government has the right to then request it from those third parties, which are often businesses. Um, and yeah, so that's that. Um, that said, CTRs have been required for financial institutions since the 1970s whenever a customer withdraws large amounts of cash or cash-like instruments. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are best analogized to electronic cash, and therefore applying these same rec reporting requirements to cryptocurrency withdrawals has at least the benefit of technological neutrality and parity with long-standing obligations placed on traditional financial institutions. If a report is required when I take $10,000 in cash from my bank and I put it in a suitcase, then it's not unreasonable that a similar report would be required when I move $10,000 from my cryptocurrency exchange. One second while I scroll. And, uh, and put it into my hardware wallet. Unlike the so-called Swiss rule, this approach does not create a double standard between legacy financial services and crypto companies. And unlike the options listed by the uh, big fat F, uh, financial Action Task Force. This approach does not ban or otherwise limit citizens' rights to hold their own crypto. Yay! Look, there's no ban on non-custodial wallets, which is what everyone was fearing. No, this is kind of what everyone was expecting. Like, if you use an exchange, if you use a custodial wallet and you want to move out of it, guess what? They are going to try and trap you. Or is going to force them to try and trap you there. They don't want you... To hold your own keys, because holding your own keys is the whole point of this thing and why it is a big deal. So, yeah, it's good that they're not banning uh, non-custodial wallets. I don't think they could have any way. That would have been stupid. But, um, yeah, uh, this is what happens. Like, <laughs> if, you, uh, if you give your privacy and private keys over to a company, don't be surprised when they try and keep you there and try to learn more about you when you try to leave. Um, other than that, Coin Center is annoyed that once again, legislation is being pushed at the very last minute with a shorter than usual comment period. There's only 15 days allowed for this public comment period rather than the standard 30 to 60 days. And I saw some talk on Twitter about uh, possibly funding their ability to work over the holiday break so that there's at least one thorough response from legal minds uh, on this matter. Yeah, I'm a little bit more worried about like the implications of the reporting threshold and details here. Like... The, the whole idea of banning holding your own keys was just really silly. But I think that how this is going to really play out is really going to be a lot more insidious than that. Um, like first, um, I, I tried to buzz through as much of the actual um, proposal as I could. But a few things stuck out. Um, one... They are explicitly asking for the transaction ID involved in any reported transactions. So it's not just dollar amount, crypto amount, name. Um, they're actually required to hand over the transaction hash to the authorities. So the Treasury is going to start hoovering up the actual on-chain transactions and addresses explicitly and not just be able to to go get that from a business later um two um obviously here um they bring up the concept of structuring so any kind of transactional history um that's set up specifically to go under these thresholds will itself trigger the exact same things as the thresholds. So that's really fun. And then <laughs> the, the, the this is the one of the big kickers to me. Um, SARS. Um, you're not only required to explicitly report transactions over $10,000. You're not only explicitly required to keep long-term records of that for any transaction over $3,000, but you are also required if a financial institution knows, suspects, or has reason to suspect 
and think about how open ended that last one can be when you start bringing chain analysis into the picture. Um, has to file SARS for any transaction or um, aggregate group of transactions amounting over five thousand dollars in the case of a bank, or if you're just a money service business, two thousand dollars. So not, not only is it the 10k means the treasury learns about your stuff, but you know the SARS aspect of it, where if a SARS is generated, they're also going to learn about your stuff. And the thresholds for those are way lower than the explicit reporting threshold. Yep. Um, yeah, so this is like, I mean, again, this doesn't really surprise me because this is the kind of thing that like the chain analysis, chain analysis companies have been uh, putting out there as positive and they keep praising this. In fact, uh, the CEO of Elliptic did a talk with Blanco, the head of FinCEN, and the summary of that, well, the, the actual talk, of course, is uh, behind a, you know, a little form that you have to fill out in order to hear it because, of course, they want to KYC anyone who's watching the video in case, I don't know, I guess they want that data on who's watching it. Um, so I haven't seen it because uh, I need to figure out a system for uh, getting that. Um, but yeah, the summary of the discussion said something along the lines of, you know, it's it would be wise for crypto businesses to comply with all of FinCEN's guidances and be on their good side. I think that's what they said, be on their good side. So all of the bullshit from these people about how, oh no, like... They do blockchain analysis, but they care about your privacy a lot. Like it's like privacy is a fundamental value to them. That is fundamentally bullshit. Like any of them who are supporting this, and pretty much all of them are, um, yeah, you're you're just full of shit. Um, the idea that this has anything to do with respecting privacy, the idea that this won't be a just another another nail in the coffin of building the financial surveillance state um you are beyond naive and i don't think you are like you'd have to be like the people who build this stuff if they're building it and they're fundamentally that stupid would that would be amazing to me i think they're just lying they want to promote this image that they care about privacy so that they I don't know, some people think that they can't criticize them more because, oh, look, there's a thing where they say that they care about privacy. It's like, no, <laughs> it's just lip service to get you to stop talking, but they're lying. Uh, they're just straight up lying because their actions are the complete opposite of what's coming out of their mouth. Yep. And if I wind up being correct in a hunch, the funniest part about this is um, I see a very high chance that the Treasury, the IRS, and so on and so forth eventually just roll their own chain analysis services in-house, um, especially if they have regulations like this coming out that give them a huge edge to gather more and more um, identifiable metadata. And at that point, um, what the hell do they need private companies doing that for? Yeah, I mean, uh, wouldn't it be amazing if the uh, blockchain surveillance software made by hacking team found its way to actually being used by <laughs> the IRS for financial surveillance? That would be, I mean, that would be exactly what they wanted. Um, and they got paid handsomely for it. Eh, congratulations, Coinbase. Well, I mean, just why Why wouldn't you? Once you start piling up enough data, um, you know, you have that big silo, um, just start applying it yourself. I mean, ultimately, a lot of the heuristics for these things are open. Um, you can roll your own. Um, honestly, there's probably a massive amount of room for chain analytics to just become more accurate because of how naive and stupidly a lot of these companies apply things. So it's just like, that seems like the obvious end game move to me. I mean, to be fair, like the kind of information that a lot of people who use these services are, are doxing already. Um, 
like the amount and name and rough time of when it happened. I mean, any I don't think you would even need an analysis for that necessarily. I mean, you could probably figure out which transactions those are, but you know, you know, might as well be explicit and include the transaction ID because it's not not that far off. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like th- th- this was something I got a little worried about like a year or two ago, just thinking about that. Like if people are buying and selling Bitcoin and that purchase or sale on an exchange happens in a very close, tight window with when it leaves or enters the exchange on chain, then it's like, yeah, I can find that. I mean, how many transactions with that value were there in that block or that small set of blocks not very many but yeah um the surveillance state is coming yeah and it's i mean i mean there's literally there's no limit on what could apply below this threshold because you know they claim to have this threshold but obviously the threshold is pretty much worthless when they can say, oh, well, we think that what you're doing is purposely making your transactions smaller. And it's like, okay, they can just, they can pull that out of their ass whenever they want to. So this is going to be, you know, hanging over everyone's head, not just people who make large transaction amounts. Oh, yeah. I almost completely forgot about this. Um, the one last thing I saw before I passed out and stopped reading last night Um they are in a roundabout way um kind of caving a little bit on acknowledging that bitcoin is money or a monetary instrument um rather than whichever random thing different regulatory bodies call it um and they're doing this specifically to put it under the secretary of the treasury's arbitrary authority to just define whatever limits or thresholds he wants because he is allowed to do that with money or monetary instruments. And the argument they're making is because of the the fact that control of a private key effectively equates to control of the asset, just like a literal paper bearer bond, that that makes it a monetary instrument or like a, a bearer asset. And so I kind of just have to beg the question, um, well, um, what about multisig? Because I don't see any way that that meshes with multisig, except if um, it is a multisig address where one party does not have enough keys to unilaterally spend something, then that's just a de facto partnership or de facto incorporated entity because otherwise there's literally no way to assert an owner to that. I'm sure they're going to uh, refer to it eventually as a multi-host wallet, Shinobi. Uh, I I think that they are going to get explicit with that clarification of multi-sig because I mean... The multi-unhosted wallet. It's almost like an it's almost like a Alice in Wonderland uh, scenario. Well, Just I mean, stick it, on in front of it. Strictly speaking, from a regulatory point of view, that's always just kind of been a hanging thing. I mean, that's just how pretty much anything financial works. If people do a thing, but don't explicitly incorporate, there are situations where they're they're effectively de facto incorporated under some category, and if they're trying to make this key possession argument explicitly like this to keep it under the treasury's uh arbitrary authority like that then it, it like they're gonna come out eventually and explicitly make that statement with multi-sig like I, I don't see any other way that could be interpreted under this i mean i'm just i'm just annoyed by the fact that they feel the need to keep making up words like why why call it why call it self-hosted, unhosted, blah, blah, blah? Why not just use the actual words that people know? Like, 
clearly the goal of this is not for people to understand the policy because they're con like we constantly have to decipher what their new words mean for things that we actually use and know about it's ridiculous like they clearly do not want this to be something that people understand <laughs> because they are in charge and you will use the new speak dictionary nah i don't like your words i reject them well, speaking of rejection, um by the way, before we move on, I want to mention that after the interview that we did, um I uh, cuz we were talking about like a uh, double spending with timestamps with uh the interview and I just thought we could call that double speak if someone tried to like double spend a statement or something. Well, now who's making up their own terms? I'm not making up a term, I'm borrowing a term. I'm actually doing the opposite. I'm borrowing a term that many people are familiar with and I don't need to explain what doublespeak is and they will probably get it. And it will help them understand something that is new. I just see somebody redefining terms arbitrarily. But rejecting the overlords and the dipshits and the treasury. So... Kraken has made an announcement of an announcement of a thing that they're going to do and want to hire people for. Um, so they, they are officially um, publicly committing themselves to, in 2021, um, hiring a team specifically to focus on Lightning Network and uh, Lightning integration. And are shooting to have deposits and withdrawals available on Lightning um, sometime in the first half of 2021. But the thing I do want to point out here is they don't even have developers yet. Um, when I saw this, this announcement, I saw a giant wave of people on Twitter like patting Kraken on the back for like finally doing this you know something people there have promised uh for a while now and awesome awesome um but literally none of the pieces are on the board to actually deploy this yet they they don't even have lightning um competent devs to start working on an integration so um as awesome as it is that they're kind of committing themselves to this um there's kind of that underlying problem there and I'm betting that this is going to become a big issue in general for a lot of larger exchanges um, when they eventually get around to accepting that they should integrate Lightning. And uh, yeah, that's kind of a, um, a bad dynamic in terms of businesses. Um, and the resources they have available to do something that their customers want, because frankly, given the uh, regulations um, that we just went through that FinCEN's proposing, there is really no way around um, that becoming a massive global systemic risk to privacy on the network unless people start using Lightning. Like you can't just report a transaction ID over the Lightning Network. You, you can point where you sent it, how much it was. This does not inherently dox your UTXOs. This does not inherently give the treasury the ability to track you in perpetuity from that point. And just looking at things like rendezvous routing, where the sender and receiver literally um, just meet in the middle so don't have to learn IP addresses, um, UTXOs involved in their channels um, through means of deduction. And um, <clears throat> yeah, that's really the only way I see to mitigate this kind of, of demand for information without just creating an escalating... Um, you know, shit show of people trying to get around things and then stricter regulations happening, um, which is pretty much how that would go with anything on chain. Um, <clears throat> but if you normalize and build out lightning support everywhere, um, that's just kind of how it works. 
and, and there's like it, it is a much more complicated space of trying to play that game of cat and mouse and come out gleaning more information than it is on chain so yeah <clears throat> that is really important for these businesses to start supporting protocols like that and it's probably going to start becoming a bigger and bigger problem of who is capable of actually doing that integration um and where are they are they going to work on integrations for companies like that can these companies find those people um that's going to be an issue just watch a customer who withdraws or uh, deposits from a light from the Lightning Network is going to be accused of structuring. Why are you using microtransactions? You're clearly structuring. That is a hilarious can of worms that will open eventually. DOS the Treasury. Yeah. Alrighty. So, ever wonder? Um, what it would be like if somebody made their own closed private lightning network? Uh, not really. Well, we're going to find out anyway. Um, and this is actually um, some old news from last month around this time in November, actually. I just did not notice this. Um, and uh, popped up in the most recent version of uh, Lightning Labs um, Lightning Newsletter. But um, the um, LN Markets, a derivatives exchange built on top of Lightning Network, um, has built what they are calling LN Clear. And the entire thing is pretty much a... Uh, a private lightning network uh, with KYC peers specifically to handle um, settlement of over-the-counter derivatives products. And kind of the entire rationale here is um, just market dynamics. Um, when, when you're looking at the conventional legacy system, um, you know, the, the three core aspects of a, an exchange happening, the custody of what's being traded, um, the price discovery or you know order book operation, and the actual clearing and settling of things. Um, <clears throat> these are usually different entities um, doing all of this. And in this space, it's it's generally all the exchanges are doing all the things, um, settling things, custodying what's going on, and operating the order book. And you know, the guys at LN Market kind of point out um, that's not how a lot of traditional traders and institutions are used to dealing with things. Um, you know, with all of the risk concentrated in a single entity and especially um, unregulated entities as most of the uh, derivatives exchanges and platforms in this space are to one degree or another. And so <clears throat> the entire idea here is to, with this isolated private lightning network, with them in the center of it, um, kind of just have this closed KYC network where you can settle um, actual derivative um, closures and even um, margin fees over the network atomically and pretty much just move something over to the LN clear side whenever you're making a payment or locking something up um, to enter a position and then settling that over the private lightning network as well. And um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the argument here is kind of just keep funds in the actual trader's hands as much as possible and keep the um, small degree of stuff locked up in positions or paying margin fees um, with this private operator who's KYC'd and verifying everybody involved and remove the counterparty risk, kind of shift things to a more legacy-like model where all three of those functions aren't locked up in one entity's hands. And hopefully... Um, save a, a lot of money in terms of processing too. And there's the added benefit of security in the sense that all these channels are going to, um, you know, the lightning um, network markets guys operating this 
um, and it's a private isolated network. So even in the event of keys being compromised, I mean, no money can go anywhere outside of that network. And the most recent state enforces, unless the operator signs off on it, um, the current status of things, um, the current balances, and where they're going to go on chain. And that can't be messed with um, just because one side of a channel was hacked. And they're going to start out um, pretty much building out Bitcoin options, um, which have been getting more and more popular lately with this. Um, but they also go on to talk about the potential of other types of derivatives and financial products as well. Um, the potential for um, stable coins um, being ported to the Lightning Network, which at least in the case of uh, Liquid, I believe, is something they're working on building in compatibility for non um BTC um, assets on Lightning to use on top of Liquid. So pretty much um, with a tool like that, you would be able to have fiat denominated private Lightning networks to settle these types of derivatives over too. So um, yeah, um, I think just one, this is going to be interesting to watch um, because, hey, it's a, it's a, completely isolated private network um people have talked about that for years and reasons why people would do that but as far as i'm aware this is the first time um, somebody's actually done it and two um i think how this works and scales is going to show really how much volume you can have processed over payment channels um, in terms of actual trading before you start seeing the <clears throat> how far you can push things without running into liquidity problems and reorganizing channel balances, having enough balance to actually settle a position with a trader and so on and so forth. So this is uh, probably something I'm going to keep an eye on and might bring up again on the show sometime if something happens. Mm -hmm. So Janine, why does Mozilla hate Bitcoin? Well, that is a complicated question, but one of the many unfortunate side effects of Firefox being funded by Google in an effort to pretend that there isn't a browser monopoly is that Firefox uses Google safe browsing, which is a default feature that is supposed to warn you if you're visiting a quote unsafe or malicious site Lately, though, this is why people visiting BTC Pay servers, even private ones, have been getting a bright red warning screen that claims that they are uh, visiting a deceptive site. Even Nicolas Dorier's own blog was uh, blocked with this, and it's happened regardless of domain or host. So uh, I don't know if they ever figured out what the reason was or what caused this, but on December 18th, the BTC Pay server team tweeted, please Firefox stop using... Google safe browsing, it is producing tons of false positives, impacting arbitrarily the businesses of people. Um, and it sounds like in maybe some instances that this has been since fixed, according to Nick Herbert of uh, Foundation Devices. He said that it was being fixed by Google. But um, I haven't checked whether any of the sites that were showing this screen have uh, been restored. But yeah, it's a stupid feature um, that, for the most part, I don't think actually works very well, even for actual malicious sites. Um, so someone most likely has been reporting something to do with BTC Pay Server to the safe browsing uh, infrastructure that is now going out across all, you know, instances of Firefox, and yeah, if you want to disable Google Safe Browsing, there is a link with instructions on how to do that in the show notes from someone who also complained separately about using Google Safe Browsing and hating it and wanting to turn it off. And before deactivate it and the NSA steals your Bitcoin. Yep. Yeah, it's just... Uh interesting example of the um subtle ways 
all over how the internet works that uh, you can just add scary friction and uncertainty as far as normies doing Bitcoin things. Yep. You'd think, though, that your browser would be smart enough to figure out that if you're visiting your own server, it wouldn't block you. Well, I guess not. Yep. So are we ready for some lulls? Are they unsafe lulls? You can now pay for Pornhub Premium with 13 different cryptocurrencies. As of last week with MasterCard and Visa severing all ties with uh, Pornhub, you can now pay for your pornography with Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Dash, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, Litecoin, Monero, NEM, Tether, Tron, Verge, Waves, and Zcash. But unfortunately, we are unable to accept credit cards at this moment. Wait, no spank chain? <laughs> I completely forgot that even existed. Where, where's the love for spank chain here? That's an obvious miss. I mean, wasn't the whole idea to allow porn creators to monetize things themselves without platforms? You know, it kind of makes sense if you think about it, why Pornhub wouldn't like that one. Yeah, I guess. But, you know, I mean, you you got to think like, you know, what is where is the market of cryptocurrency using porn fans? Um, Spank Chain probably has a bunch, you know. Might as well give them an outlet if you're going to accept accept everything from Bitcoin to WAV. I don't even know what WAV is. It's a shit coin. I think there's a lot of porn lovers using WAV. I do not. What about Zcash? Probably not. Lots of stripes. It's actually, I, from my understanding, a decent amount of... Um adult entertainers that are starting to just accept Bitcoin payments um, with their own setups. I think there's even a few out there using BTC pay. Yeah, I mean, if anything, I would say Pornhub is a bit late to the game. I'd say a, a little bit more than a bit. But yeah, I, I am looking forward to a hilarious future five years from now where the same way you have Bitcoiners from uh, the 2013 class screaming at themselves about the giant pile that would be worth millions of dollars that they spent on drugs and why the fuck would they do that? I predict at least a small class of 2020 or 2020ers Whatever, Bitcoiners from the class of 2020 to have a similar reaction four or five years from now thinking about how much money they spent on porn. Wait, we have a class now? We have a class system? Yeah, it's like high school. Come on, like the year you showed up. Ew. You've never heard Bitcoiners refer to like when they arrived in those terms? Not really. I've only heard like OGs and... uh. What's what's the nickname for new people? New coiners? Noob noobs. Yeah, that too, sort of. Well, I will continue to not watch porn at all, let alone pay for it. So. Ding, 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 ding. But congratulations on accepting a method of payment that you should have taken years ago. They'll all learn eventually. So, drama update from the East. Hmm. So, um, last we checked in um, with Bitmain, McCree Zan and Jihan Wu were engaged in crazy legal battles um, in multiple jurisdictions and different levels of the subsidiary um, chain involving the, the companies as a whole. Um, <laughs> and, and lest we not forget the private security team that stormed the, the Bitmain Beijing office. <laughs> but um, apparently um, there is an agreement forming. And 
McCreezan is pretty much um, going to borrow six hundred million dollars um, against his um, Bitmain shares and buy out Jihan Wu's um, ownership. And there's pretty much going to be a weird um, split in terms of different aspects of the company. Um, so the uh, cloud mining service um, that they have, uh, Bitdeer, um, btc.com, and all of the mining farms that they operate overseas are going to be spun off from the main um, ASIC manufacturing business. And um, Jihan Wu is going to be kind of taking control of those aspects of the company. And McCree is going to maintain control over the manufacturing of ASICs um, for crypto and AI, Antpool, um, and all of the mining farms operating domestically in China. So pretty much, um, yeah, all of the um, assets minus the manufacturing side of things are getting cut in half um, with McCreezan keeping things domestically housed in China and Jihan Wu taking over all of the things internationally. So, um, yeah. Bitmain is getting a divorce <laughs> and Jihan Wu is just keeping some of the, um, you know, actual mining operations, um, running equipment um, themselves while leaving McCree, the manufacturing side of things and all of the equivalent operations in China. So yeah, this is uh, going to get interesting. And I think, um, you know, we're going to have to just wait and see how this plays out in terms of manufacturing market share of McCree's and Spitmain now. Um, because at least uh, Jihan is going to need to buy hardware somewhere if he's going to be running these companies actually operating um, mining farms and such. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, probably going to get a little weirder before it's all over. Shinobi, would you mind if I give some breaking news? How dare you? So someone on Twitter named Jimmy McShill, great name. Uh, I don't know, not familiar with this account at all, but it's now being shared by a bunch of other people who I do know, so might as well point it out. There is a tweet from Jimmy McShill saying that um, someone has claimed to have dumped the whole uh, ledger uh, data breach records onto raid forums, which I am not familiar with, but it says, Today I've uploaded the ledger.com database for you to download for free. Um, the leak contains two text files. Uh, 1 million emails subscribed to the newsletter, 272,000 orders with full info details, email addresses, uh, email addresses, phone number. Um, yeah, so just for anyone who might go out looking for this, I mean, you might be really curious to be able to verify it, but you should obviously not just download uh, files from strangers on the internet. Uh, so be careful if you're going to do that. You better know what you're doing too, because we don't know if there if there is a, uh, a secondary attack vector being planned here uh, for people wanting to look into this dump to see if it's real and then it has something nasty in it. So yeah, just be aware that uh, the people who have been getting phishing uh, emails and texts and stuff. Uh, it is possible that your uh, information is now publicly available on the internet. You just somehow, with the timing of that, made Bitmain look competent-ish. Yeah, I guess so. But yeah, if that is true, um, that is fucked. And I am so fucking happy right now that I have never bought shit from fucking Ledger. Like, Jesus H. Christ. Yeah, I have period never bought 
anything crypto related that is tied to a phone number or email or physical address that is tied to me. So good luck. Like all of my hardware devices have not come via that method. Like that's really dangerous. Like that's like, you know, phishing and scamming attempts. Um, how about physical robbery attempts? Um, <laughs> yeah. Like that's out there publicly right now. So it's not like it's just in the hands of some hacker now who only set out to do phishing scams. That's just out there for the general public. Anybody who, who wants to do something shady um, with somebody who owns Bitcoin. Hey, look at the ledger, the leak, the address. What kind of area is that in? Is it a nice area? It is a, is it a well-off area? That guy's probably got a decent amount of Bitcoin then. Let's go rob him. Yeah, that would be the main thing. Well, and the other thing is they let now anyone can escalate the phishing attacks on these people. It's not just the whoever's been behind it so far. It's anyone because they have the email and the phone number and the physical address. So with those things, you could probably... You know, if if any of these people still have a landline, you could find a landline, just harass them, and all ki- there's all kinds of things you could do with this information. Yeah. It just, it boggles my mind, like, I do not understand why any of this information was available online for someone to even take in the first place. Like, sure, do you want to keep records of customer orders sure print them out on paper or keep it in an offline device like you do not need to keep this on a live server where someone can just come and take it like it makes no sense to have this much sensitive information available for this to happen because this is beyond stupid that people who bought devices over several years probably before they knew that this kind of thing could happen and when they were, you know, conscious of it, now have to worry about it. Yep. And think about all the people out there who just bought a ledger, started buying Bitcoin or whatever, and put it on there, and they don't pay attention to anything. They don't watch podcasts or news shows or go on you know, Twitter and see what's going on. They just look at the price chart every once in a while. They have no clue that this happened. Yeah, I mean, I bet you anything, someone might even try to do something really targeted where they look, because I'm sure that the order information probably includes the date when it was ordered. Yep. And I bet you anything, they're going to look specifically for people who bought during like all time high periods because those are usually the new people who are just buying to get into the hype. And they look up, oh, where do I put it? How do I hold it? Oh, ledger. Okay. Done. Buy. Okay. Like they're just going to look at specifically for people who bought during certain periods because those are people who are probably not taking very good care and caution with their coins after all this time. Yep. Well, good job, Ledger. Good job. Well, the you know, the fun part is uh, we all know where the Ledger office is. So if anyone would like to uh, break lockdown and go uh, protest outside their Paris office, you know. Pee on the door. All righty. I guess uh, next one is just a super duper quick announcement of literally two paragraphs. Uh, So Coinbase filed their form S1, um, which is the first step um, towards making an initial public offering. Um, Yeah, so nothing approved, nothing really rolling in terms of that starting. And um, as the entirety of the second paragraph of the announcement says, this does not constitute an offer to sell or solicit or an offer to buy any securities. Any offers, solicitations, or offers to buy or any sales of securities will be made in accordance with the registration requirements of the Securities Act of 1933. 
I.e., we're, 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 we're doing it, guys, but no, we're not breaking any laws here. This isn't saying buy, buy our IPO or anything like that, but we're filing for it. Wink, wink. Yeah, I'm sure it has nothing to do with uh, the Bitcoin price. By the way, I think it's gone over 24000 and under 24000 just now. Indeed it has. I'm sure that has nothing to do with why they want to IPO. Oh, nothing at all, nothing at all. I'm sure that they're not going to try to conflate, you know, the the rising price of Bitcoin with uh, the rising price of their company, which is conveniently named after a part of the Bitcoin system. I don't, I just don't know whether uh, I am more irritated at the fact that this happening is going to put a fuck ton of more money in Coinbase's hands um, to just be douchebags with or delude myself and be hopeful that going public might actually lead to them doing less stupid things because people want to make money. But I don't know if I can delude myself that much. All right. Silence. What is your announcement, J9? Well, it's not really an announcement. Um, it's just a reminder that I'm giving a, well, this kind of should have, maybe gone at the end as a final thought, but I'll say it now anyway. Um, if you want to learn about why Coinbase sucks and how they're helping to contribute to the financial surveillance system, um, I'm giving a talk tomorrow about financial cancel culture and surveillance and all that kind of stuff um, for the Bitcoin Munich meetup, and you will be able to attend remotely over Jitsi, not Zoom, fuck Zoom. Never doing that again. CCP malware. But yes, punks, go watch that. Go learn things. Go yell at people to stop doing dumb shit like that. What do you think, Shinobi? Should I uh, raffle off a, a ticket to CCC to get people to come? <laughs> Why not? I don't know. I feel like I might get in trouble for that. Do it anyway and beg for forgiveness. <laughs> but what other development news do we have? So, Andrew Chow is proposing a update um, that would create a new version of PSBTs that would not be backwards compatible. Um, and pretty much... Um, the, the big changes here are mostly just locking in in the metadata fields um, of the PSBT, uh, a lot more input and output related data, and um, would remove a current field in a PSBT version zero that is pretty much just the actual transaction itself, um, raw. And pretty much... Um, you know, the, the idea here is to just have a lot more um, solid um, metadata commitments to things like the values, the index numbers, the transaction IDs, um, the sequence numbers and lock times of things um, so that different uh, software or devices and so on handling things could coordinate um, and kind of safety check things a little more simply. And at the end of the day, if this were to be implemented, it would always be possible to just take um, this new version of PSBT when supporting tools are done handling it and kind of just downgrade it um, to the original version zero if any software or tool um, that didn't support the new version had to interact with everything. But one little neat thing in here is a global field that would um, kind of allow preferred um, lock times for a transaction to be set um, for everybody to coordinate around and um, fill in the appropriate end lock time value. And also sequence number and end lock time requirements for inputs um, so that tools could um, 
kind of just quickly look at what lock times um, everybody signing or who proposed something to sign wanted to lock things to. And then also, um, if you have a case of dealing with multiple inputs that had different lock times on the uh, script in, in that input, um, it would be easier to kind of parse um, different lock time values there and then arrive at um, a, a transaction level lock time value that would be valid for all of the inputs. Um, you know, let's say you had one that uh, had an expired time lock and one that wasn't expired yet. Um, you would have to at least unlock time to the one that uh, wasn't expired for the longest time. Otherwise, some of those inputs would be valid, some would not, and the transaction would be invalid. But um, yeah, little little proposal tweak for PSBT, and uh, hopefully it happens. All righty. And what does last? <sighs> An OXT um, report analyzing the flow of 1,000 Bitcoin stolen from the Singapore exchange KuCoin. And I need a second here because honestly, um, aside from one aspect of this report, I feel like I'm just reading the same report um, over again for the third time. So pretty much um, back in September, um, the stolen coins were broken up and some were filtered through a centralized um, mixing service called chip mixer and a smaller section or no, no vice versa um the uh, the larger section of coins was sent and mixed through wasabi so the the tldr just looking at what they broke down in public um because as you should know i am not going to pay money for a report that uh you know, I can just look at in two weeks and probably verify everything I'm saying now for free. Um, pretty much those coins mixing through Wasabi, um, the total amount was only partially mixed. And the unmixed change output um, that kind of pulled out without mixing from that transaction cluster um, was a relatively large chunk of what was mixing through Wasabi. And as usual with these reports, um, almost every time so far, the person who stole these coins um, took outputs from the centralized chip mixer and outputs from the mixed um, Wasabi output set, as well as the unmixed change, and started condensing things post-mix um, with a pretty large amount of coins that de-anonymized and rendered useless the mixing they had done. And <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I am just kind of getting really sick of these reports um, that are able to de-anonymize stolen coins um, pretty much every single time solely because the person mixing doesn't know what they're doing and fucks up and almost always with a very large amount of money that already is difficult to mix using mixing tools um, because it is just a larger pool of money than the usual volume of most mixing tools so yeah no shit um, <laughs> you are able to de-anonymize and correlate this stuff because the person trying to mix coins fucked it up themselves. But the one interesting thing in all of this is the existence of a centralized mixer that is kind of piggybacking on top of Wasabi, um, a mixer blender. Um, and a, a decent amount of the um, mixed outputs um, that were cycling through Wasabi were actually um, this centralized mixer blender um, 
that was kind of doing an interesting thing here where um, mixing through Wasabi, um, they were able to kind of funnel coins and um, pay um, pretty much pay out from the centralized mixer um, before actually receiving inflows from Wasabi. And so I think probably what's going on there is using some of their own capital um, to kind of be mixing things um, to obscure the in and out flows from the centralized mixer so that that doesn't um, correlate properly in terms of timing. Um, but Samurai was able to kind of um, suss this out given the fact that, again, the thieves um, kind of blew their own shit up and started condensing things post-mix. Um, so, yeah. Um, really, at the end of the day, um, if people are going to steal large amounts of Bitcoins and try to launder them, um, they should start actually learning how privacy on a blockchain works because every instance of large hacks like this making attempts to mix funds always unravel because after mixing um, and doing idiotic things during mixing, they undermine all of that just condensing coins again. And as a random aside, I just have to wonder why none of these entities or thieves have ever used um, Samurai to mix things, because I can only think of two explanations. Either Samurai is blacklisting um, tainted coins like this through their coordinator, or um, big thieves like this just do not trust using Samurai. Um, <laughs> or they i mean i would think the main reason is because you have to use a mobile wallet it's a mobile wallet and you have to use a phone and i'm guessing they feel like that's too high of a risk to do that that would be my guess no they have the desktop client for whirlpool um so that you can keep remixing yeah they do but you i mean you know, you still have to use a mobile device for this to work. So, no, no, you, you, you don't. That, that's what I mean. The, um, like the desktop app is pretty much like another wallet that will just stay online all the time and sign for remixing that you put the same seed from your mobile wallet in. Like you, you oh, can use they separated it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, that's just because uh, you can't really remix um, on a mobile device because it's not going to stay on all the time. It's going to power limit, turn off um, and all that. But yeah, you, you can use Whirlpool um, without touching a mobile device. Alrighty, that's good. But yeah, I just I feel like I have to drive home one last time, though, like these reports that de-anonymize these massive thefts like this after they try to mix, they would not exist if these thieves learned to stop fucking up post-mix transactions. Um, <laughs> like, literally, I cannot think of a, an instance like this where that has not been the reason that things were unraveled. Update to the breaking news, Jameson Lop says that the leak of the ledger stuff is legit. Joy. Well, this is going to be not fun watching the consequences of this play out. Alrighty. Well, I guess uh, last thing up for the day, uh, you just got a quick little shout out. Well, I thought it would be quick. Um, basically... Uh, Chelsea Manning's birthday was on December 17th. She turned 33, which is, um, as per her tweet, she didn't expect to make it to 33. Um, and hopefully this will be the last year that she ever has to set foot in a jail or prison. Um, given the grand jury situation. Uh, but yeah, some interesting news was published on her birthday and i haven't fully decided whether uh this makes me really pissed off that this was published on her birthday or not but 
The Intercept, um, specifically Sam Biddle, who I'm not a fan of at all, published an article about some training material that the Pentagon, uh, the Department of Defense, has been using that involves her and i think i want to bring it up just because i mean the material pisses me off but it also pisses me off that this had to get published on her birthday because it you'll see anyway the article says both civilian contractors and enlisted personnel are commonly required to complete a js us 007 a pentagon course designed to increase your awareness of terrorism and to improve your ability to apply personal protective measures According to Joint Knowledge Online, a Department of Defense educational portal, JSUS 007 requires a variety or covers a variety of grimly serious topics from detecting roadside bombs to surviving active shooter scenarios and skyjackings. The training also covers so called insider threat attacks, the attacks of terroristic violence in which members of a group strike the group itself, like uh, the 2009 Fort Hood, Texas shooting, in which Army Maj, uh, this kind of got messed up, so I don't know, he can't write properly, or the copy-paste is wrong. Um, anyway, Department of Homeland Security defines insider threat terrorism as an unlawful use of force and violence by employees or other others closely associated with organizations against those organizations to promote a political or social objective. Other definitions may differ on technicalities, but like other acts of terrorism, the unifying theme is the violence of the acts. But unclassified JS US 007 materials uh, obtained by the Intercept show that the Pentagon's anti-terrorism trainees are learning a far, far broader definition of terrorism, one that includes the entirely non-violent acts of manning on a slide listing examples of acts by individuals thought to be loyal to the US, Manning's 2010 leak of over 500,000 documents concerning operations in Iraq and Afghanistan is listed first, followed by three examples of murder, the 2009 active shooter attack at Fort Hood, the 2003 active shooter attack at Camp Pennsylvania, and the 2001 anthrax attacks against government facilities that closely followed the attacks of September 11th. Another slide of the presentation lists Manning's alleged anti-American sentiments as pre-attack indicators. Uh, and it says both Manning and her attorney, Moira Meltzer Cohen, declined to comment on this story. So, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of a fuck you birthday present to publish an article on someone's birthday saying, look, your government considers you to be a terrorist. Um... So I'm going to leave that aside because I have so many things to say about that. But also, seriously, the U.S. government has literally no grounds on which to make this claim. They, first of all, did not even, I don't even think they attempted to charge her with terrorism back in 2013. Uh, or and leading up to 2013. And furthermore, in 2013... Uh, following the court martial, uh, she was not charged and not found guilty of uh, aiding the enemy. So anyone who's going to claim that she helped terrorists or was helping terrorists, the U.S. government didn't even convict her of that. She was never convicted of that. It was just unauthorized disclosure. So, yeah, this whole idea of... I, I mean, like, every time a whistleblower comes up, they keep saying, you know, use the chain of command, blah, blah, blah. That is something that she did. <laughs> like, every single whistleblower, pretty much, that has come forward in the past several years has attempted to contact their chain of command. <laughs> in fact the US government lies about the fact that they do this. They they bring they bring this up to imply that they didn't do this when in fact they did. And then if you actually ask these agencies, why didn't you do something about this? What did they tell you? Blah blah blah. What they usually say is that I think there was even uh I think it was with Thomas Drake. Um or someone worked with Thomas Drake or was uh a supervisor or something and he like explicitly said you know the kind of stuff that 
Thomas Drake brought forth, like, if, if that, if he heard that, he just wouldn't care. Like, it would get reported, and he wouldn't even bother to listen. Hey, Janine. So, what? Go- going to your supervisor is a pre-leak indicator. I mean, yeah, it basically is. Um, because a lot of the people who do that, who actually follow the supposed guidelines of what you're supposed to do when you're... <laughs> Uh, when you're trying to, you know, point out that someone has broken the law, including the agency that you work for, um, yeah, you basically you basically become the person who has broken the law. That's how you get treated, as if the mere fact of you pointing out that someone has broken the law is a crime. Um, that's basically what happens. And so it just makes me sick that... <laughs> that the U.S. government feels justified in training people working for them to consider one of the most well-known whistleblowers who revealed war crimes and, at the very least, the death and murder of two journalists in Baghdad, uh, that she's being considered a terrorist? For literally leaking a video that shows the U.S. military acting like a terrorist group, shooting civilians from the sky, giving them no opportunity and at no provocation whatsoever. I mean, that seems to me to be the definition of terrorism is to attack someone who is defenseless and unprovoked. So, I don't know. I guess... If the if if your definition of terrorism is so broad to include a whistleblower publishing documents revealing war crimes, I feel like the U.S. government would easily fit into the definition of a terrorist organization. Yep. But they're also conveniently the ones who get to define what a terrorist is. I guess everything is terrorism nowadays. Pretty much. Well, but... I just hope that she didn't have to read this on her birthday because, seriously, The Intercept, you, given your past with whistleblowers and not protecting their identity, you might want to be a little more sensitive to not ruining someone's good day. You know, I think you've ruined enough of those. Probably more to come. Well, want to jump into final thoughts? Um, my final thought is, well, I think I've already given them because technically the things I've already talked about were final thoughts. Well, I hope you all got tickets to CCC. If you didn't, you can come to my talk tomorrow, which is basically being given on the same platform. I don't want to talk about the pardons. Like, there's so many rumors about pardons. I don't know where these journalists are getting their sources from, but it sounds like they are full of shit because there's been multiple times now where it's like, we're going to get some pardons today, and then nothing happens. So I don't... I don't, I mean, part of me is like, well, maybe he's now deliberately telling different people different things to figure out who is talking to the press because that's, (laughs) that makes sense given all of these rumors that keep popping up. So maybe he's spreading some false ones on purpose to figure out who's being a naughty boy in the White House, Um, which is funny. It's like the last two months of his administration and you're still dealing with a uh, leaky mouths, but whatever. Um, I'm not, I'm not hinging my bets on any pardons, but I would like to say this. I mean, if, if we're going to hedge any bets, um, I would say that Snowden is not going to be on the list. And the reason for that is that the U S government Broadly, this administration, the last one, and previous ones, they seem to have a tendency to only give mercy (laughs) 
in the instances where the punishment extrajudicially given has already been merited out. So I wouldn't expect them to pardon a guy who has at least not been to a U.S. prison or been in a prison at all. So the reason that Chelsea Manning got clumsy is because the U.S. government and military literally tortured her in other countries and then tortured her in the U.S. So they kind of made a boo-boo that they had to fix. Whereas with Snowden, he got away free. And oh god, do you want to encourage more whistleblowers to leak more amazing documents showing the corrupt nature of the system? Without them getting a little bit of punishment first, I don't think so. So if anyone's making yes. bets, I would, I would say that they are not going to want, want to do that. that. It doesn't matter if you want it, Shinobi. It's about the message that they think it sends. They are not going to let a guy who got away and is living happily and free with his partner in another country and about to have a child... Uh, they are not going to pardon him. They're at the very best. They will only pardon the people who have already been unjustly punished. That's Don't underestimate the way it works. a man child looking for any way possible to say "fuck you." <laughs> but speaking of that, I just accidentally set this up perfectly. Um, for all the Michael Saylor fanboys out there. You know, give it, giving him his daily tug job because he bought big stack of Bitcoin. Um, he just advised Elon Musk to shift Tesla's balance sheet into Bitcoin, and Elon responded with, "Are transactions that large possible?" So, fuck your uh, PayPal regulatory cocksucking douchebag, Michael Saylor. Watch Elon Super Chad shift Tesla and SpaceX and Neuralink and fucking the boring company all into Bitcoin reserves and Mega Moon and take everything private and turn into the Bitcoin Lex Luthor motherfucker. That's a fucking Chad Bitcoiner. Boom. He probably sure, totally no, won't do that though. He's just a super troll. <laughs> Wasn't Elon Musk one of the founders of PayPal? Yes, or something. So I don't know if you can necessarily fuck PayPal through Elon Musk. Well, yeah, you can. When it first started and they built shit, it was actually like a digital bearer instrument very early on. And they actually wanted to do something like Bitcoin, except obviously the regulators circled and that never happened. But um, yeah, you know, Elon's trolling aside. Um, let's go. Fuck Michael Saylor, Elon's the Bitcoin Chad. But didn't didn't Elon also say that Bitcoin is BS? Yeah, but he's also a complete troll whose entire existence on Twitter is to just trigger people. Well, well, no. yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, that that is my thought for the day. You got any more for us? Beep, nope. Boop. Merry Christmas. Oh, wait, we're, um, when is our next show? <laughs> Two days after Christmas. So yes, ma Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas or whatever you plan to celebrate on the 25th of this year. Merry Christmas, you filthy animals. Peace. Bye. Sang it just